right, so for those of you who don't know, Mo Isom is a former collegiate soccer player from the Louisiana State University, a New York Times best-selling author, a nationally sought-after speaker, and a powerful voice rising up for her generation. She and her husband, Jeremiah, and their three adorable kids, follow her on Instagram, uh, live in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we just want to welcome her back with as much excitement as we can. So will you please welcome Mo Isom. Hello. You guys, I'm really emotional. I'm emotional. I've been crying on and off. I don't know why. I'll probably cry now. I don't know if it's hormones. I have an eight-month-old. My body's leveling back out. Um, or if it's just a move of the spirit, I think it is the second because I had prepared what I intended to talk to you guys about. Um, and this morning, God just woke me up with a very specific word and a specific touch. And so my beautiful notes became a scrap paper. Um, and I think it is because he specifically wants to talk to some, if not many of you in the room today. And I'm so, so, so excited for what he has to say, even though it's really hard. And maybe all of us will cry, who knows? Um, that's the joy. We can let the makeup just run off and who cares? I'm excited too to be back because how fun was last time? Last year when we were here, we like dug into some really, really good stuff. Who's new? Who's a seventh grader? New to the mix, they're like, who's this giant girl with a mop of hair? Listen, y'all, have y'all heard of the curly girl method? Okay, I'm trying to re-embrace my curls and just work with what God gave me. And I did this really confident story on my Insta story last night about my progress in two months. And I sounded so sure. And then I woke up this morning and styled it. And I was like, dear Lord, I have to go stand on stage and it looks like this. But we'll work with it. Um, just don't watch the Insta story. It's fine. Um, don't take any photos. The point is, I'm excited to be back. Uh, my name's Mo. I, um, well, she introed, but I get the amazing privilege of, of being about God's business. And it is one of the hardest and one of the most beautiful journeys. Um, and it was special what happened here last year. And I think the Spirit moved in a really powerful way, and I'm excited to see again what he's going to do. Um, to share a little bit of my story, if you weren't here for the testimony, last year I was raised up in a Christian home, um, worked really hard to be a good person, right? Sort of raised up in that religion, that faith by inheritance. Uh, my parents were Christians, so I thought that was like, I was a Christian, and I'm in church on Sunday, and Bible study, and... Uh, maybe the Christian school, like you guys. It's sort of uh, going through the motions of these things, and that was fine. It was good um, until I started to mature and develop, and the challenges came and pressures came, and um, I moved into high school, and there were a lot of weights I felt on my shoulders for perfectionism, for performance. I was an athlete. I was a soccer player. Any soccer players? All right. Um, and the enemy got the better of me in that season, and I developed eating disorders that was just vicious. I was fixated on control. Nothing seemed like it was going the way I planned, and so I needed to control something, and so I just abused my poor body in the process of that. Um, began to kind of crawl out of that pit and headed off to LSU, go Tigers, national champions. It's no big deal, but we're superior to everyone. So I went to LSU to go play soccer, um, and... After my freshman year, my dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger. And so suicide entered my story out of the blue. Um, it thrust me into depression, into anxiety, into promiscuity, seeking any sin-sized piece to fill the God-sized hole in my heart because I was deeply, deeply wounded and hurt. Struggled with giving pieces of myself away, left and right. I was wrestling with an addiction to pornography at the time, which is rampant right now in our culture, in our world, the way we've normalized these things and the way they are wounding our soul is traumatizing. Um, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations of Church Forgot is one of my books. We dove into it a bit last year and um, would encourage you guys to grab a copy of that 
if there's struggle for you by way of any of the sexual areas. We'll touch on a little bit of it today, but I just was broken. I was hurting, and I then was headed home from Baton Rouge to Atlanta, and the cry of my heart was really understanding why my dad did what he did and seeing it as a viable option for myself, that suicide was probably one of the better choices, that it would end the struggle and the suffering and the confusion and all of these things. And I cried out, you know, if you're so real, God, do something. Reveal yourself to me. Just wreck my life. Um, and he took that prayer quite literally, and the next thing I knew, my car was on the side of the interstate upside down. It had flipped several times, and it was in that wreckage and that brokenness after the cry of my heart had been, God, do something. Or his answer will always be, I'll do anything to save your life and to save your eternal story. It doesn't take a crazy car accident. All it takes from the King of Kings is a whisper, and it changes everything. But for me, it was a car accident on the side of the interstate where I was hanging upside down by my seatbelt and the spirit of the living God entered into that wreckage and said, would you be still and know that I am God? I love you. I see you. I'm for you. I took a cross for you. In this world, you will face trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Put your faith in me. I am sure. I'm steady. I will lead you, teach you, heal you. And it was too real, it was too tangible. An encounter with the living God changed everything and I chose to pick up my cross and follow Christ and nothing has looked the same since. It's not all been butterflies and rainbows and amazing highs. The walk of a believer, of a true Christ follower rarely is. Um, but it's been holy. It's been really hard and really holy. And God's delivered me of an addiction to pornography he completely pulled me out of my shame and my pit that used my body to try to find love, removed me from that, healed me, and then blessed me with an incredible husband. Now I have three kiddos who are awesome, and my husband's 6'5", and I'm 6'1", and my four-year-old is four feet tall. It's very startling. My children came out 10.1 pounds apiece. Well, my girls. My two-year-old looks like a four-year-old. They came out like, Wah. I'm like, oh, God. And they're big. And then I randomly had a little seven-pound boy, number three. And I'm like, oh, you're my favorite. That was better. That was better. So he uh, then started nursing and fattened up. He looks like a sausage casing with dimples. And he's the best. He's so cute. Oh, let's just talk about him the whole time. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, his little booty. He's just so cute. Um, anyways, his name's Ronan. But I get to be a mom, and not that that's the end-all, be-all by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a neat blessing for a girl who only ever knew brokenness. And I think um, I continued to walk with Christ to learn what it means to be God's daughter and the hard things that come with that and the great things that come with that. I um, have written a couple books and have laid down my life to travel and to reach Girls, just like you, so that you would know no matter where you are or what you're walking through, that there is a Heavenly Father who fiercely loves you. And there's a means in which you can know Him and be known by Him, and your life can transform completely. So I want to pray before we jump in, because it's specific kind of to that topic, and I feel, um, what in that? <laughs> I feel a very specific word for your group, and um, I want us to be prepared for it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Yahweh, God, El Shaddai, God Almighty, we just come into your presence, Lord. We just thank you so much that you are good and you are holy and you are righteous and you are full of authority. You are powerful. You're the maker of the heavens and the earth. And in the same breath, God, you know every single hair on our head. You are intimate and you are kind and you are tender, and you love us. God, I just thank you so much for that truth. God, I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would just put a muzzle over my lips, that nothing would come from me that is not of you. God, would your words flow? Would you take every one, and would you just prophetically translate them to every single heart in this room? I know very few of them. You know every single one of them, and you know every piece of their story, God. So use these words to speak directly to them. 
God, I remove any offense, any fear. I bind up any spirit of shame, any spirit of uh, just death. That the enemy would come to steal, kill, and destroy any blessing you have on my life, on the lives of these girls, God. I just bind these things up. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And those who are free are free indeed, God. So we just invite your Spirit into this place. And we ask that you would move, that you would minister, that you would touch us, and that you would speak to us in a powerful way. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, I told you I'd cry. It's just going to happen. I don't know why. But I woke up this morning. Um, and I was just praying for you guys. I had such a cool message I thought I would give. And then he just said, I need you to speak to the fatherless. I'm like, well, what do you mean, God? Because it felt different. I've gone to different venues and felt a similar word. And it was like, those who truly did not have earthly fathers, like their fathers were dead or there was divorce or they were gone completely. But there was a very tender touch from his spirit this morning that said, I need you to speak to the fatherless. The ones whose fathers are not gone, but they are not there. And I don't know a ton about you guys, but I know that many of you... um, probably come from, from families that are, that are doing well. If you have the means to be here, um, you might look like you have every earthly blessing and wonderful thing and stuff and great home and whatever you ask for, but I think you know that your soul is still not satisfied, is longing for something more, and you can't quite put your finger on it because you have a lot of things, but the thing you want the most is the eyes of your father on you. Just his presence. That he would see you. This message is so not to throw anybody's dads or families under the bus by any stretch of the imagination. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that he would actually touch your dad in a supernatural way and raise him up to be all that God intends him to be. But I do feel like there are girls in the room who the family model looks intact and from the outside looking in, it looks like you guys have everything together, but you're longing for intimacy and for love from your dad. It's really hard and really confusing when someone would say, like, oh, God's your heavenly father. And you're like, what does that mean? Because you're longing for intimacy to know and to be known, but the model isn't really rightly being set for you of what a perfect father looks like. In fact, that's applicable to every single one of our lives because none of our dads are perfect. Everyone has fallen, everyone is prone to sin, everyone has weaknesses, and everyone has struggle. But there's some disconnect in your mind, in your heart, that is inhibiting you, that actually hardens and angers you, that you have to come to chapel each week, that you have to go to Bible class, that you're constantly surrounded by and hearing these prayers. And often there's this talk of a loving father, and you're like, there's a disconnect in any appeal of the father model or word. And so a lot of times we have one of two reactions. We, in response to our longing for intimacy, to know and to be known, we either um, hide or we're running. We're hiding or we're running. And I cry because this is something at 30 years old I just butt up against in this season of my faith walk that I just moved through, I realized as I was communing with God and getting amazing words from him and feeling so near to him, 
Um, it wasn't a posture of sure peace and love, of a steadfast, sober-minded walk of like, God, you're good. If I feel you near, praise God. If your voice is absent for a while, that's okay. If you discipline me, I will receive it. If you bless me, I will be glad. It wasn't just like the sure walk of a believer moving forward, I found that I was waking up in the morning, every morning, like, Daddy, please don't go away. Like, God, please keep speaking, please keep doing something, please keep moving, please keep being big, please keep letting me have these mountaintop moments. Daddy, please don't go, please don't go, please don't go. And I'm like, what is going on? I'm a 30-year-old woman. I've been moving in ministry. I've known Christ for 10 plus years, and yet I'm waking up fearful that I'm going to do something wrong and God's just going to go. Because at 19, out of the blue, because of his own struggles, my dad, my one who was supposed to be good and provide and stay and be sure and be steady, put a bullet in his chest and bailed when things got hard. And I remember standing over his body on a morgue table wondering how this tiny little Bullet had taken out a man the size of Goliath. And I'm still processing a lot of fear and abandonment and fatherlessness that impressed on my story and I think in many ways is impressing on some of yours. And as a response, because we're longing to know and be known. We're longing for intimacy. We're either hiding or we're running. So there are some of you, does anybody have a tissue? I'm so sorry. What's wrong with me? Growing up, I was like, I never want to do women's gatherings. I don't even like to go to girls' things because everyone cries. I'll never be the crier. And then I just got up here and I'm like, welcome. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> just estrogen. It's just a lot. Um, but there is a group in this room who, in response to your longing for intimacy, you're just hiding. You haven't gotten it. You're not getting it. You don't know what true intimacy looks like. And so you just isolate yourself. Like maybe you're present, maybe physically you're there with other people, but your spirit, you just isolate yourself. You stuff things down. You don't want to process. You don't want people to see the messy parts of you. You don't want God to see the messy parts of you because you've never known that you could bring the sin, the mess, the, the, the hard things to someone and then receive it and stay. You know, this is what transformed the woman at the well. Christ met her there and he sat by her well if we know this story from the scriptures, this is a woman who had been married five times and wasn't even married, um, but living with a man at that time. She carried shame like a cloak over her shoulders. She was out drawing water at high noon because she didn't want to be around people. She had a reputation that preceded her. This is how Christ found me in so much of my sexual mess. She chose isolation. Let me go draw water when no one's out here. Let me just live my life. Let me just do my thing. Let me just not really have to be vulnerable or available because every time I've thought that, thank you, every time I've thought things were safe and sure and okay, I've, they've, they've gone south. And so we just pick isolation. We just do my thing. And she's back and forth drawing from this well, back into life where a reputation precedes her, where she's just living in sin because it's easier really oftentimes for us than knowing and being known. We just prefer to stay anonymous. But Christ meets her at the well and he dignifies her, he speaks to her. And he offers her living water that she would never thirst again. That he has what she's longing for deep down, even though she acts so hard on the surface. 
And she's like, oh, I want that. I'll take that. I'll take that living water. And he's like, then let's uh, first deal with this. Let's deal with what has you so shamed. Let's deal with the mess. He says, go get your husband. And she's like, yikes. Don't have one. Have had five. Not living with the man. Not, but all the things that have stamped her story, he drums up. And in the face of her filth, what's so transformational about her story is that in the face of her filth, knowing all the mess about her, he stays. He offers her living water that she would never thirst again. And she takes off after receiving that great touch of intimacy and love and grace. She takes off and is one of the first evangelists in the Gospels. See, some of you guys are isolating you're stuffing things down, you're avoiding handling it, and really you're just mad at God. So you don't even profess faith, you don't even want to learn about it, you don't, it's like I'll just do the Christian school thing and put up with all these people and they're annoying and there's a lot of zeal and zeth and I don't get it and that's fine. You're just mad. And you're hurt. And so you're holding up. Like, I'll just do me and figure things out on my own. But you lay down at night, and it's not in a confident posture of like, I'm amazing at doing me and figuring things out on my own. Nothing is lacking in my life. You lay down at night, and you're like, why do I still feel empty? And then there's some of you who are just running. You're performing. You're striving. You are earning. You are me. I was performance-minded growing up. I was the athlete, the competitor, be the best, do the best. If I had an amazing game, I was daddy's best girl in the front seat of his truck. We'd go get ice cream. If I had a bad game, I got the silent treatment from my father, and I wasn't spoken to the rest of that day. Any tension, any frustration, any argument at the home, he just went silent. I got the tight jaw and the flared nostrils. Do we know them? Do we get this sometimes? I do it to my own children, and I'm like, smack out of it. Don't do the flared nostrils. And he just shut down. And so I performed. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll do better. I can do better. And my whole life was geared around proving that I was worthy of him loving me. And a lot of our lives feel geared around if I can just do X, Y, or Z, or if I can just be the lead in the play, or if I can just become, I don't know, like art stuff, but it seems big here, uh, like first chair. Is that a thing? Okay. If I can just da 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 then maybe I'll be approved of. Because when I do X, Y, or Z, my dad finally shows up or tells me that he's proud or whatever it may be. But when I come home with a wrestling match happening in my heart, it's another guy at school who's burned me. It's another person I've given a piece of myself away to in hopes they could make me feel loved. It's another struggle. It's another weight of depression or anxiety I feel. It's another hard thing. When I come home with that and put that on the table, no one really is there or wants to handle or hash things out with me. So let me fake fine and put my best foot forward and live like our culture tells you. You have to live. Get the likes and the follows and the fake it till you make it. And let me just perform. And we're so desperate for intimacy. But both of these things, either hiding or running and performing, both of these things still leave us void. And so then often we go look for what we think is intimacy, to be loved by somebody else. This is where all of our sexual struggles come in, where all of our identity issues come in. Am I worthy? Am I enough? Am I seen? Am I liked? Am I desirable? Let me prove that I'm a little more desirable. 
I want to feel a connection. I want to feel intimacy. Maybe it's this guy or this date or this thing or this friendship or this friend group or this Insta post or this many likes or whatever it may be. We look to the world to affirm that we're worth something because we're dehydrated, we're thirsty. And Christ is saying, do you want living water that you would never thirst again? The hiding, the running, none of it ever measures up. You're a daughter longing for the love of a father that stays. Intimacy is different than lust or pleasure. Or often, this is a heavy word, but we'll just say it. Take it for what it truly means. Masturbatory faith that we walk through. That word, masturbatory, it means self-serving, self-seeking. We want the high and the rush and the thrill in the mountaintop. And so it's like this false facade that we kind of move through and try to promote to others of like the amazing highs of all things faith. And that's all great and that's all wonderful. And God is incredible. And when the blessings come, it can blow your mind. And when his touches on your life, it can change everything. But there are seasons too, even in the walk of the faithful believers in this room, that are valleys, that are hard that are confusing, that are discouraging. There are things we see in ourselves that are not pretty. And the difference between this masturbatory faith, this comfortable enough Christianity, this prosperity-minded life of like, God's good if my situation is good, but if my situation's not good, I'm going to figure things out. I'm going to do me. I'm going to curse God. Like, I don't even know if God's real or if he, any of these things. This double-mindedness leaves us like waves tossed on the sea. And the difference between fake faith and a pleasure-oriented Life, seeking the highs, and just getting annihilated by the lows. That is different than intimacy. Intimacy is love that stays. It's love that celebrates in the highs, and that sees all the yuck and the mess and the weaknesses, and loves you just the same. Intimacy is communion together. You see me, I see you. God, you see all of me, and I want to know you. Intimacy stays. It's dynamic. It's a true walk of a Christ follower that has highs and lows, but a divine hope along the way that doesn't need to seek from the world to be filled because instead we turn to the world. God, speak to me. Teach me. Intimacy is not finding a great Bible verse and posting it on your social media so think people will think you are pious. Intimacy is finding your place into the hidden, unseen place, in the car, by your bed, in the prayer closet, in your own heart, and saying, God, I love you, and I don't understand everything, and I'm struggling but God, I know that you see me and you know me and you love me and you took a cross for me and so please meet with me here. Intimacy is the quiet cave of your heart that no one else has access to. That you wouldn't shop your heart around in hoping that somebody can fill it up. Some guy, some boyfriend. Intimacy is that God would dwell there and you would guard your heart. Intimacy is good, and it's sure. And we're longing for a father's intimacy. But I love what Luca 10, 41 talks about, if we know the story of Mary and Martha. 
Mary's a doer. She's a, or I'm sorry, Martha's a doer. She's a performer. She's busy. Christ comes and he wants to spend time in their home. And Martha is busying herself with all the things, right? We do all the things, do we not? Let's look to Matthew real quick, 7, because he speaks of this very thing. Matthew 7, 21, and I would heed this as a warning to many of the doers in the room. It slapped me in the face and punched me in the gut and woke me up from my sleeping in the faith. It says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, wait, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we performed miracles in your name, but I will reply to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, workers of lawlessness. This isn't speaking to believers and non-believers. This is speaking to those who would profess Christ as Lord. And in the end, when we stand before him, what he's saying in this parable is there are many will say, wait a second, wait, didn't you see what we did? We we, we perform miracles, we prophesy, we cast out demons. I posted those scriptures and, and, and I was on the worship team and I was also on the prayer team and I was also doing all of these things and I showed up every Sunday and I da 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 we list off all God that we did for you. Wasn't it enough? Didn't I perform and didn't that earn something? And he said, that's not even the fullness of what my will is. I never knew you. You ran, but I said, be still and know that I'm God. You performed, but I said, your good works are not what I'm here for. They're like minstrel rags, and that's in the Bible. Sick. They're like minstrel rags that are not born of the Spirit. Fear led your way, but I called you to faith. Oh, darn. I wasn't even paying attention to time. (laughs) We argue back our good works, and he says, the will is that I want to know you. I just want intimacy with you. Isaiah 30, 15. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Another version says, in returning and resting you will be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. With Mary and Martha, Martha was busy, she was doing, she was performing. It was perfectionism and anxiety and all of these things that led the way. She had great intentions. She wanted to make a place for the Lord. But Christ himself, when Martha said, Mary's doing nothing, she's being extremely lazy, she's sitting at your feet, and I'm the one doing all this work. Rebuke her, please. Tell her to get up and help me. Jesus says in his words, My dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all of these details, but there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken from her. Do you realize Jesus is giving permission for you to be worried and concerned about something? But it is not, oh, where do I even fit my time in with God? I've got band practice, I've got performance, I've got school, I've got class, I've got homework, I'm trying to balance a social life, I'm trying to have a boyfriend, I'm trying to figure things out, I'm trying to do all these things. Where? I get so many DMs. Can you tell me, please, where, how do you fit in time with God? He says if you're going to be concerned about anything, worried about anything, it's how you fit in life in light of the amount of time you spend with God. God, you get my first fruits. You get all of me in this hidden place. I want to know you. I want to be known by you. I want to eat the bread of life that is your word. I want to drink of the living water that is your grace. I need healing. I need wholeness. I need you. I need boldness. I need my eyes open. I need a touch of your hand because everything in my life looks whacked out. Oh, but I know you are sure You never leave me or forsake me. You are good. You are holy. You are mighty. You are wonderful. You are loving. You stay. 
I know intimacy with you. And so if I'm going to be concerned about anything, it's going to be how on earth I fit in the rest of life in light of that. We got our priorities out of whack. Because we're hiding or we're running, because we're hurting. But the one who's set by the Samaritan's woman at the well is Jehovah Rapha, the great physician, and he wants to heal your heart. He wants you to know a father's intimacy that changes everything. Take it from the girl whose father bailed and was emotionally absent and lived vicariously through my sport and my performance and was amazing and wonderful, and I love my dad. But it wasn't the perfect model of a perfect heavenly father. I had to learn that through my communion with Christ in the hidden place. So I want to encourage you guys into that same place. I don't know where you stand. If you know Jesus, if you're walking with him, if things are vibrant, or if you know Jesus and have been walking with him, but you're like, whoa, suddenly I'm coming up for air and I feel so far from God and I don't know what is going on. If you don't know Jesus, if you're on the cusp of understanding, of taking a step of faith to believe in him, but it, it, it's still there's a disconnect between Father. Or if you are in hiding, isolating, denying, angry, and don't want anything to do with him. I just want you to know that he loves you. And he wants nothing more than for you to know him and be known by him. He wants nothing more than for you to lift your eyes up and see him and rest in him and just come to the table. This is it, God. This is where I am. This is what I'm dealing with. I'm sleeping with a boyfriend. I'm crushed under the weight of perfectionism. I, I, there's tension at home. There's divorce or there's the abandonment. I'm struggling in my friend group. That was my picture of relationships. And suddenly my best friend just gossiped behind my back and everything's off right now. This is where I'm at, God, and this is what I'm dealing with. And I'm longing for more, and I can't put my finger on it. So maybe, just maybe, it's you, it's intimacy with you I need. And Scripture says, draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. So I just want to encourage every single one of you to take a step towards him. And watch what he will do he loves you and he won't fail you he's never failed me sometimes things look different than I thought but he's never failed me sometimes seasons are hard but he's never forsaken me and so I'll just testify to his goodness from a broken fatherless promiscuous girl who looked for love in every place I thought I could find it and nothing ever measured up he just wants to be with you and it's important to pray how that journey could begin. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Lord, I don't know who in this room God is. I feel, Lord, like there's someone specifically, maybe a few, but someone in this room right now who literally this morning got into a fight with their father. Or woke up, I just see like a waking up and a weeping. And then we put on our makeup and we pretty our hair and we step back into school and we hide and isolate our spirit from anyone knowing or seeing us. And we start performing in hopes that we can fake fine. God, but the hearts of your daughters are wounded and abandoned in a lot of ways and discouraged in a lot of ways. And we claim, oh, it's with Christ, it's relationship, not religion, yet we don't even know what healthy relationship looks like. God, would you touch us 
with your spirit. Would you draw near to these girls as they set their eyes up and say, what would you have for me, God? Lord, would they break up with the boyfriends that every time it's ending up in sin, Lord? Would they forgive the friend who hurt them? Would we see reconciliation amongst friend groups? God, would they find accountability? Someone or several people they can just be themselves with and pour things out to and be encouraged and lifted up by through the word of God. God, would this campus see a move of the spirit that births discipleship? true discipleship, that the older girls would help walk and lead and guide the younger. I see like a coupling happening, God, of the older girls finding the newer ones, Lord, and just sisterhoods forming. God, would you break off any spirit of striving and performance that is ill-hearted in the hopes that it's earning your favor or someone's favor. God, we are not marked by our works. We are marked by your grace. I'm just getting the word divorce too, God. I don't know where divorce has impacted this room, God, but would you tend to wounds left by that fractured love that doesn't look like it stays when things get hard, when things aren't happy, God. I pray that you would bring restoration to the idea of marriage and what it even means to be the bride of Christ and you, our bridegroom, the marriage, the oneness you intend between us and you, God. You don't leave. You don't divorce. You don't fracture. Lord, your love stays. And we look in the mirror and see all the things we can't stand about ourselves, but something about your love, about looking to your word, about finding the quiet place in prayer, about coming to know you and being known by you, it doesn't change the exterior of what we see in the mirror, but somehow it reaches deeper and it transforms our heart. The real place that needs healing and revival, God. And somehow then, we look in that mirror to the one we didn't love or even like, and we see that every single one of us, they're an image-bearing creation of God. We see immeasurable worth and value and dignity without our striving or performance and without our self-protective nature, God. We see you, and we see how you see us. And intimacy is in the midst of it all. God, we praise you and thank you for this time. I ask that you would just touch these girls with a fresh wind, a fresh fire of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, God, Carol, she's back. This morning was rough. Um, no, it wasn't. It was great. <laughs> Hi, welcome back, you guys. I hope you all have been having a good day. I loved getting to go... Um, hang out with some of you guys during the in-between time and um, just share and chat and hear uh, from a lot of y'all and from uh, your administration and the leaders who really genuinely love you guys so much. Um, just what your needs are and what response was and what God is doing. It's exciting and hard and holy all mixed together. And I think if there was any like takeaway from today, or at least from the first talk, what I hope you would have picked up a bit from all of that is the reality that um, life is a lot, and it's dynamic, and people are imperfect, and relationships are hard, and brokenness is real, and abandonment is real, and the longing for intimacy is real and complex and dizzying, but God is perfect in his love. And he loves you and he sees you. And he longs for you to look to him, to know him, 
so that you can find healing and you can find peace. And you can know how to walk through things that are hard, even our own home environment, even our own head space, even our own heart issues, even our relationships with friends and with guys and whatever it may be, you can walk through things that are storms, that are hard, that are broken. You can walk through them with a divine hope. And what I love is that he doesn't ever just leave things in the messy, broken, hard space. So sometimes hard conversations, they stir up the really cruddy stuff, and we just want to, like, again, stuff it down or run from it or whatever it may be. We, we, we are hard-pressed to get uncomfortable. But the good thing is that the, the wrestling match is what brings breakthrough. And so I wouldn't just draw you into a hard talk about fatherlessness and your confusion on intimacy and abandonment and leave it there. I want to encourage you guys in this time of what shifts when we step into that intimate place with God, when we're willing to get uncomfortable, when we're willing to process through the hard things, when we're willing to bring him our crud and see what he does with it, there is a tangible shift that occurs that will change generations. It's amazing. She just prayed for revival in our own hearts, in our school, in our families, in our community. It is a tangible shift that occurs when we know the intimacy with God that revival, kingdom come, is inevitable. And so I think what's beautiful is that God is calling his daughters into that intimate place because he is prepared and ready to tend to, heal, equip, empower his daughters and commission them out. It is a move of the Holy Spirit over this generation that he is raising up his daughters. He's calling them back to his heart. He is restoring what is broken, and he is sending them out in powerful ways. Take myself standing before you as at least one example of that. God loves you, and God longs to use you. He has incredible, unfathomable generation-shifting plans and purpose for your life. And it will be the broken things that you hobbled through that once impaired you, that felt like the shackles around you, that will become the very chains he will break off of you and bind up the enemy with so that you, girl, can go on mission into the fullness of the calling that he has for you. Intimacy and letting him work through the messy stuff and reveal himself to us as the perfect father who stays, that is the beautiful breakthrough ground, the hard work, the tilling of the soil, the planting of the seeds, the watering, the nurturing, so that life can burst forth and you can know life and know it abundantly. I'm not talking about monetarily. I'm not talking about the way you want things to go. I'm not talking about the college you want to get into or the accolades or the thing. I'm talking about the abundance of a healed, restored, and bold life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has this for you. What does scripture say? 1 Timothy 4.12, not to let anyone look down on you because you're young, but to set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. If you think that intimate place is like, well, maybe when I'm like older and an adult and then I can like go do the thing and then I'll like subject myself to the painful stuff with Jesus so that I can have the powerful stuff like once I get a job or once I'm, you're sorely mistaken. He wants you to know the intimate place right now because he has plans and purpose for you right now, where you are, in the space that you're in, carrying what he's given you to carry. And so I am excited for you. I'm excited for you. Here's what we have to know, is that intimacy, the pressing place with God, the place he points out, the yuck in us, the hard things, the place he tends to the wounds in us, the place he identifies the idols in us. Idol worship, that's so Old Testament. No, that's your life right now. If you bow your head to an iPhone when it pings quicker than you bow your head to the word of God, you have an idol. If you're quick to share something on social media 
yet you don't really want to share much in privacy in your heart with God, you have an idol. If you long for the affirmation from the boys or you need the boyfriend in order to be content or you give yourself away in hopes you feel like enough, you have an idol. He wants to break his daughters free from the bondage of idol worship so that he can task you out in a great commissioning. And so why it's important now that we find intimacy with God is because the spoon feeding that you've had through years and years and years of Christian school or the spoon feeding that you've had through following your family for years and years and years to church or the spoon feeding of the gospel that you've had over time will not sustain you when you step out of this school and you need steak to survive in a world that is messy and complicated and heavy and layered and on the attack for those who would claim to follow Christ. You can't eat crackers any longer. Your soul will feel discontent. You will hunger for more. And if you want to know boldness and freedom and power in this place and when you're sent out into the real world from this place, you must know intimacy in the hidden place so that he can, like, build you up, work things out, move on from the spoon feeding to give you more substantial things, and it'll feel hard, but then you'll see breakthrough, and then he'll point out another thing in you, and it'll feel hard and crushing, but then you'll see breakthrough, and you'll find in this intimate place this pulsing work with God, being a perfect father who stays, who loves you. He's like a coach in a gym, saying, lift the weight, push harder, more on the bar. It hurts, I know, it's heavy, but you're gonna see gains here. He's like your your teacher leading you through the performance on stage. Let's do it again, run it again, rehearse it again. I'm annoyed, I'm frustrated, I can't nail that it's too much. Yeah, but the performance is going to be powerful if we can get this right. He's a father who's saying, baby, I love you. I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. I made you, I knit you together, I have plans and purpose for you. Let me teach you and raise you and guide you in wisdom. Because baby girl, the real world's coming and I want you to be ready. And this is the beauty of intimacy is that intimacy is what brings strength and safety, sure-footed resolve. I've known the hard stuff with God, and he's stayed, and I'm stronger for it. I've brought to him my struggle with pornography, or I've brought to him my struggle with lying, or I've brought to him how much I'm cheating, or I've brought to him the gossip that courses through me, all the things that he's pointed out in me. I've brought it to him. I've humbled myself before him. I've trusted him with it, and he has done something in here. He's changing my heart. He broke those things off of me. I don't long for that stuff anymore. Somehow it was hard and it was messy, but I feel more safe, more sure, and stronger because I knew intimacy with God. It wasn't a guessing game. Oh, I really want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but where, how, what, what, I just feel some wind or a loud voice from heaven or what is it? No, you find yourself in the intimate place with God. You get into his word, you submit yourself to prayer, you let him do the work inside of you as a good staying father. And in intimacy, you find strength and safety. Because in intimacy, you learn the rhythm of what Peter said in Acts 2, that each of you must repent of your sins and turn back to God. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, in intimacy, when he points out what's not great in us but promises us he'll stay, he just wants us to hand it to him, and we find the beautiful rhythm of repentance. This wasn't great, God. I'm so sorry. I don't want this. You can have it. I am repenting of this sin. It is by Christ's grace alone that you forgive me. That is when we receive what Peter said, the gift of the Holy Spirit. In intimacy, when you allow yourself to be emptied out, he promises you that he will fill you up. An indwelling, a filling of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what brings boldness. 
The Holy Spirit is what fills us and equips us and strengthens us and makes us bold. Not a fake false bold. Because you clap back at somebody on Instagram doesn't make you bold. Someone was like, oh no, she knows about Stephanie. It was one time. It was rough. (laughs) Should have heard what she said. No, our ability to be fast talkers or slick or think of the best comeback or stand up for X, Y, or Z, that's not really true boldness. Because as soon as the pressure comes or somebody claps back again or we come toe-to-toe with a world that's screaming a different message, we usually then cower and back down. We see it in Peter's life, too, one of Jesus' disciples. While Jesus was alive... He said, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die. Guess what? Before a rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, I would never, I would never. And that's half of our expressions. I love Jesus, I'm following Jesus, I've been in this Christian school. I am sure I would never get out into the real world and have a hard time standing for him. And yet, you'll delete a post that not enough people like. Because we're craving the world's confirmation and we crumple if anybody pushes back. And this was Peter's case too. He loved Jesus. I would never deny you. And then sure enough, literally at one point, Peter standing toe-to-toe with a slave girl, a girl who would have no impact, no ability to really do much or cause much of a scene. She was seen as, as not important. And yet a slave girl comes toe-to-toe with him and says, weren't you with Jesus? He says, no, I wasn't. He crumples at just a slight push of force back on what he was sure he believed. But then we know Jesus takes the cross, he dies, he's buried. Three days later, he rises, he defeats death. This is historical account. He comes back to life, reveals himself to many, and in doing so, he comes upon the disciples. The Holy Spirit is poured out in them at Pentecost. Jesus ascends. He says, I have to go back to be with my Father, but I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. It will lead you in the way you're to go. It will bring you boldness. It will teach you. It will convict you. It will guide you. It will walk with you. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. So Christ communes with them. He heads back to heaven. And then they are gathered and the Holy Spirit comes upon them and emboldens them in such a way that the same Peter who crumpled at the pressure of a slave girl suddenly a few verses later is standing toe-to-toe with the Pharisees and Sadducees, the ones who could ruin his life, They had just killed his king. I think they had some power. And yet he's standing toe-to-toe with the religious leaders of the time, and they're telling him, you've just healed a man. What's going on? You must be silent. Don't speak of this Jesus. And Peter's response is, I'm sorry. I cannot stop telling you about everything we've seen and heard. So something shifted here in Peter's time when he crumpled at the slightest pressure, and then when he stood toe-to-toe with a world that could have crushed him and said, I can't stop telling you about what I've seen and heard. This is true boldness, and it's predicated by humility because humility and intimacy is what indwells us with the Holy Spirit. And it's important that we find ourselves in that place because God wants to indwell you, and he wants to use you. His best for you is not You living in the same routine of sin struggle and falling asleep every night crying about the same woes. His best for you is not you bound up in sexual sin because you're too afraid to break up with the boyfriend that is so popular and that you think, is his name Daniel? I'm getting Daniel in my spirit. I don't know if there's a Daniel on campus. Is he popular? Who knows? This happens sometimes. One time I was in a gathering of like 30 people and I was like giving this word on when Jesus calls out your name. And so I'm like, so what name is he calling out? Is it Tim? Is it Wanda? Is it Steph? And then my brain went blank. I said, I'm so sorry. I, it's like 30 people in here. This should not be nerve wracking. My brain's gone blank. I can't think of anything except the name Tabby. Like a Tabby cat. I'm like, I'm, I don't know, I need to get back to my note. All I can think of is Tabby. I kid you not, this woman's like, I'm Tabby! Her name was Tabitha. Who knew? 
Spirit of God. So, I don't know, maybe you need to break up with Daniel. I just say it when it comes to my spirit. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know your life. But the reality... (laughs) Focus! The reality is that I don't know what I was talking about. Uh, Oh, he doesn't want you (laughs) to continue to live a mediocre, dejected, wounded life. He wants to know you and to be known by you so he can indwell in you and you can go from wounded to healed. You can go from meek to bold. You can go from imprisoned by your life circumstances to walking in freedom and using them for the glory of God. Here is what this looked like when he began to do this in my life, in my heart, when I came to know him, really. I'm not talking about rote religion of you thinking you're saved because your parents are Christians. I'm talking about when you choose to take accountability for your own walk of faith and your own eternity. And you say, God, here we go. Teach me. Lead me. I believe you by your grace I want to walk a life of significance and purpose, and I want to stand before you in great confidence the day I go, because you won't stand next to your best friends before the Father, and you won't stand next to your parents, and you won't stand next to your boyfriend or your teacher, and you won't stand next to the Instagram pastors who you think when you go watch their account, you've somehow spent time with God. You know the voice of your favorite influencers better than you know the voice of the Good Shepherd, and it won't stand for much in the end. God wants intimacy with you, He doesn't want you thinking because you watch Stephen Furtick rhyme on a clip that somehow you spent time with him. Stephen Furtick's great with words. I love Stephen Furtick. But we need to step away from our idols and step towards the Father. Because when you do that, when I did that, his grace began to reframe everything in my story. And suddenly it wasn't identity issues of, of... struggle of not knowing who I was and perfectionism that owned me and performance, suddenly I went from woeing about identity issues to proclaiming that I was a daughter of the Most High King. Suddenly I went from self-harm and eating disorders and tearing down my living temple brick by brick to proclaiming the goodness of a God who restored me. Suddenly I went from being imprisoned and wounded by fatherlessness to proclaiming the goodness of a heavenly father who never fails us. I went from depression to abiding joy, from addiction to pornography to radical deliverance, from perversion and promiscuity to understanding true intimacy with the father, from shame that so bound me to proclaiming the goodness of the cross of Christ that takes away our shame. Would the anthem of your life be what Acts 4.20 says, I cannot stop telling everyone of what I've seen and heard. If you know intimacy with God, you'll take any opportunity to share with those hurting the love that you found. You suddenly will see things differently. You won't be walking around the campus anymore gossiping about who knows who and what knows what and failing to see that those girls you're tearing down with your words are also image-bearing creations of God whom you know nothing of their life when they go home. Perhaps they're fatherless and need a touch of his love. That can come through you. I'm only in seventh grade, I don't know, and there's seniors and there's juniors, and they seem to have it more figured out. No, there can be a boldness upon your life, no matter what age, no matter what grade, no matter if you're the starter or if you're on the bench, no matter if you're the lead or if you are pulling ropes to raise the curtain, there can be a touch of boldness on your life that will affect everyone around you. Because suddenly the conversations will go from meaningless crap to the bold proclamation of a love that saves souls. And it's not weird, it's not awkward. Maybe sometimes, but I don't care. Do you think Peter cared? Oh, we're so politically correct. Selena Gomez, who released your song, The Heart Wants What It Wants. No, Selena, the heart's the most deceptive of things. 
We're led around by our heart. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say this because that might, and I don't know if, and, oh, and suddenly I feel so sad, and suddenly I'm, I'm on fire. I'm so excited. We are like puppets to our heart when he's saying, steadfast daughter, know me, make me known. I heal you so you can find the hurting. We have intimacy so you can go love the lost. I've taken your broken things and I make them bold. Don't let your emotions lord your life. Don't let your fear lord your life. Constantly be ready to tell anyone about the one who you've come to know. And this is true boldness. And this, I've seen healings, I've seen deliverance, I've seen atheists come to belief, I've seen Christians who are lukewarm as they come be filled with the Holy Spirit and come to life in God's love. I've seen families restored. I've seen the girls that had a reputation like you wouldn't believe become the girls who shine the greatest light for the glory of God. Miracles are tangible and real and alive if you'll know him in the intimate place and then say, send me, God. I'm here. Send me. Use me. This is the boldness that will come upon you, and it's the boldness that we really, really need. And I believe by the Spirit of the living God, that he wants to pour out himself into your heart. That he wants to indwell within you. That his Holy Spirit can and will use you in mighty ways and pulse through you in unfathomable ways. But that thrives when you've hidden yourself in him and found him in the intimate place. And you've allowed him to heal you and touch you, love you, and be a father to you. And evangelism's like second nature. We don't really care to talk about anything else. Guess what? All the gossip, all the crud, all the celebrity sites, all the trash just becomes a little meaningless. When I was filled with the Holy Spirit, suddenly I couldn't even listen to the same music. I couldn't watch the same stuff. It was like something shifted in my heart. and Man, I didn't want just the yuck and the trash of the world. I wanted more of him. And so many people made fun of me. And I lost a ton of people I thought were friends. And I knew a season of intimacy and aloneness with God that transformed everything. But that's the greatest stumbling block and hurdle to get over is that you guys are terrified of not being liked by the world and of having to step away from hard things. But when you stand before him, you will stand alone. And I'm excited to stand before him and hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You knew me and you made me known. And that's what he wants over your life as well. So I know we have a little bit more time. How much time do we have? Any adult? I'm going to hold up fingers. 15 minutes. Nice. So what I wanted to do, three minutes. Excellent. Um, what I wanted to do was actually just kind of open things up for a little bit of Q&A. Um, I don't want to get down any crazy rabbit trails, but I'm an open book. Do we want to use this? Can we? test. Yeah, it works. Okay. And there was lip gloss on it. Who did that? We've now kissed. Um, I want... (laughs) It's fine. Um, I want to pray over us in light of this great commissioning and this truth. And then I just want to open the door for your questions, and I'll try to keep my answers succinct so we can get to several, if there are some. But dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we praise you. I praise you, Lord, that the world tells us in order to be bold, we have to be 
feisty and fiery and know all the answers and have something to say about everything and act like we have it all together and be some type of worldly authority. But God, your gospel stands an antithesis to that. Your gospel says in order for true boldness to come upon us, we have to become very quiet and very small to come under you and allow your strong hand as our Heavenly Father to lift us up, to heal us, to tend to us, to teach us, to train us, and God, your breath to be breathed out into us that would fill our lungs, that we could go out and see kingdom come through our words, through our love, through our lives. Lord, your word says that it is humility that precedes boldness. So God, I pray that you would humble us. You would draw us into the intimate place and you would tend to us there. You would welcome our grief, our tears, our confusion, our frustration, our pain, God, and you would rebuild us into new creations. And God, I pray that in that place, we would find strength from your tender mercy that would give us faith that could move mountains when we go out into the world, into our school, into our homes. You're so good, God, and we praise you and thank you that even in our brokenness, you make us bold. And even through our hard things, you let holiness flow. I pray that you set us apart and that you transform us from the inside out in that intimate place, God. And I pray you make this a generation of, of breathtakingly bold daughters of the Most High King. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. <laughs> if anybody has any cues, I'm happy to have A's. So that here. I don't know if somebody wants to like loiter around. <laughs> there you go. Whoever asks the question can pass it or lead it to the next person. Wait! <laughs> oh, can I tell y'all a story? Y'all, nothing's holding me back from sharing the gospel. I have preached nine months pregnant, and one time I was at this FCA event, big stage, several hundred people, and they introed me, and they're like, her athletics and her endeavor and so amazing. And I'm like, thank you, say it again, yes. And so I start walking up the steps onto the stage, straight up, fell, face plant. When I say my hair flew, it was like, looked like a wig, slammed my face. <laughs> By the grace of God, my belly just came in the step. So Ronan was fine, but I was like, oh God. <laughs> And, it, and you know what the most startling part was? No one helped. No one did anything or said anything. Everyone was like, <gasps> and I was like, <laughs> I farted because I was pregnant. And so I just got up then and walked on stage. It was like, thank you. It's an honor to be here. And it was rough from that point on. Uh, so, anywho, any questions? <laughs> just real life. Don't let anything hold you back from sharing the gospel. Everything was fine. Yes, you had a question. <laughs> Sorry. It's not, okay. I was just wondering what your shirt said. Oh, it says fight like a daughter. That's what I'm talking about. You're a daughter of the Most High King when boldness comes upon you. Just fight like a daughter. Great question. Hi. Okay. Hi. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. So when you said that in like the first service that you did, you had a plan to speak about something, but then it changed because like you felt that God led you to speak to something different. How did he lead you? Like, did you physically hear him or was it like a dream or like? Oh, that's a great question. You guys, I will expand on this a little bit because this is a question we get a lot. And this is groundbreaking when I learned these things. A lot of the time we grow up in a Christian community or in the church or whatever it may be, and we hear people say, oh, I heard from God. Oh, I, I, I got a word from God. Oh, I knew God X, Y, or Z. 
And because we don't have full understanding of this, many of us sit there like, I guess I don't hear from God. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that experience is. Is it like, my child? Like, <laughs> are they physically <laughs> hearing something? What is that? If you all have ever heard of Havala Cunnington, she did a great, great teaching on this, like a, a video series online. But what she talks about and completely backs it by scripture are four prophetic personalities, types. There are hearers, there are seers, there are knowers, and there are feelers. And she rooted this teaching out of the truth that the word says, the good shepherd is always speaking and the sheep know his voice. So if this is true, that would mean that God wants to talk to us, to commune with us, that we would know him and um, that we would know his still small voice. A lot of things in scripture talk about the voice of God. So if he's always speaking, then probably what we need to learn and pray for understanding is, is how we receive what he is giving us. And this course talked on four things, the, the hearers, and so I want you to think as I'm sharing what camp you might kind of align with. First off, every single person bears the responsibility to read and know the word of God. He's spoken to you in about 4,000 pages. And you're all like, I need to hear from God, yet this is just like collecting dust on your bedside table. We are by and large a biblically illiterate generation because you think going to Bible class and reading a scripture like substitutes your time in his word. You need to read his word because he's speaking constantly through here. But also, hearers tangibly and audibly hear the voice of God. Now, we're also encouraged in Scripture to test every spirit. So if the voice of God is loud, sometimes the enemy is, is louder. We have to know the word so we can confirm what we've heard is truth. But hearers hear. I'm not that. Very cool if you are. I'm not so much that. Seers have visions. They dream dreams. They can see. See, they can visualize, they receive vision of something. Some of you guys might know this. No one really in the Christian community wants to talk about our dreams, but there's a whole lot going on when we sleep at night, and it's not mystical and weird and the way the world takes it. It is God, as he does in his word, communicating with his sheep as we sleep as well. It's really beautiful, but some are, are seers. You can just see, like, what this could be. Do any of y'all feel like you have that? You just have like vision of if I choose this, if I could head here, I feel like I have a vision, an understanding of where this could go or what's happening. You're more of a seer. Another is a feeler. And this is when people walk into the room. It's like you can just, it's hard to kind of quantify. Her teaching is really thorough, but you just feel. You can just pick up the climate of the room. Oh, no! And you can feel, oh, like I walked into a room today and immediately my heart felt for one girl present in the room. I could feel that there's something heavy on her life that she was wrestling with. You're a feeler. You pick up on the emotions, on the feeling in the spiritual environment. And this is so key because the beauty is that things can be very hard and very heavy, but you can pray towards peace. And you can go love those who you feel things towards or encourage those who you just feel are heavy-hearted. It's very beautiful, a feeler. And then there are knowers. This is where my main personality kind of comes in. A knower is very, very tricky to explain to anyone because it's just like he drops something in your spirit and you just know. You're like, oh, like this morning. I just woke up and I almost cried. I was like, oh God, there." There are fatherless girls in this room. There are some who have been abused by their fathers. There are some whose fathers are present, but they're always gone. They're always working. They're always off away. There are some who it's divorced. There are some, you really want me to touch on fatherlessness. And if someone said, well, how do you know that? I can't explain it. You just know 
And again, you go to Scripture to back these things, to seek out, oh, I'm feeling something, I think I've heard something, or I, I had a dream, or I have this vision, or I just feel like I know. And we go to the Word of God to say, does this line up with your truth? Let me test this. Is this the enemy confusing me or deceiving me? Because he's very good at that. But let me look to your word, God. Oh, no, this wasn't from you. I felt worthless. I felt like no one loves me and abandoned. No, your word says that's not true, that I carry a measurable value, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. This is how we piece through, was that that I received from God or not? And this is how many of us, in unique ways, commune with God. So, I would encourage you guys to look up Havilah Cunnington and look up the prophetic personalities quiz, or not, well, there is sort of a quiz that helps, but her teachings, because they're so thorough, they're so backed by scripture, and um, it's really, really cool, because if you have the Holy Spirit, God's talking, he's communing with you. It's what sets us apart so neat in relationship with God, not just religion. It's relationship. There have been so many times that I've changed my mind or done something different or stayed where I was or didn't fully understand why I really felt like God wanted me to do X, Y, or Z, and then he brought somebody that I could share the gospel with or he did something crazy. I need to, like, think of specific examples. Oh, just the other day, we went out after church with a few friends out to eat, and I got in the car and I said, Jeremiah, that's my husband, um, I said, I feel like something is, like, going on in... in, um, I'll make up names, Bob and Patty's relationship, um, I feel like a really heavy weight. Because you're not just necessarily one personality. You can hear from God in many ways. So I was just feeling, I'm like, something's off. And I feel like he's given me the word of knowledge that there's some tension or weight in their marriage right now, and we should pray for them. This is why he speaks to us, not that we're like suddenly, hey, Bob, Patty, marital brokenness, let me tell you about X, Y, or Z. But he communes with us so we can commune with him, so we can intercede for the people around us, for the world, for situations, and we can say, Father, you're giving me this. I don't know the answer. Let me bring it back to you. But no, at least my voice is bringing their names to your throne. So I said to Jeremiah, something I just feel like is going on. We should really pray for them. And he pulls out his phone a few minutes later, and he's like, Oh, my goodness. Okay, before we even went out to lunch, I didn't see my phone, but Bob texts me that they're having some struggles in their marriage, and if we could pray for them because X, Y, or Z, and explained that they were heavy-hearted and feeling pressure. And I was like, well, if you didn't think I was a prophet before, Jeremiah, <laughs> do you see it? No, it was just neat. It's neat. God will send affirmations and confirmations like that. So know that he wants to talk to you and pray, God, how do you speak to me? And back up what he says in the word and you will become better and better and better at recognizing his voice. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Do we have to go or we skip class and skip all the tests and quizzes? There's a question. I have no authority to say that, so sorry if you fail. <laughs> um, okay, so um, like you said, the Bible has like a lot of the answers to like how to find yourself, but like it's, like you said, it's like 4,000 pages long. It's, mm -hmm. where do you start? I don't know where to start. That is a beautiful question. Um, I always encourage people. Yeah, that's a great question. I always encourage people to start in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then I encourage people to move forward to Acts, because Acts is amazing. And then to pulse through the New Testament, and then to begin and read through the Old Testament as well. Now, that's the way that I have studied the Word of God up until this point. But I want to say a few things. First and foremost, typically when we ask that question, this is not throwing you under the bus at all, it's the question that I asked you. It comes from really a place of intimidation. A lot of the times we feel like it's a lot. What do I do? How do I do it? I hear all these people teaching on it. They seem to understand. I'm like reading these words and I see the black and white, but then someone's teaching from that same passage and I'm like, how did you even get that out of that? And it is intimidating. So we're like, I don't, it's a lot. There are countless Bible reading and study programs out there, countless resources to help you guys walk through the word of God. 
Uh, the YouVersion app has reading plans left and right. What we have to understand is it's not actually a lack of knowing how to do it because it's a book. You pick it up and you read it. It's an intimidation the enemy wants you to feel that you can't understand it. So what you need to do and what I do is I sit down and before I even start reading the word of God, I pray, dear Lord, please help me. You, I believe this is your living, breathing word of God. I believe this is dynamic and deep. I'm intimidated. It feels like a lot. But today, will you just be with me? Give me understanding. You say that true worshipers worship you in spirit and in truth. So bring this alive in the spirit to me. I don't sit down with an agenda. Okay, I need to read three chapters, and if I make sure that I read three chapters in X, Y, or Z, I sit down wherever I am. Currently, I'm back in Genesis, rereading from the beginning. And I sit down and I say, okay, God, my delight in studying your word is spending time with you. I won't be intimidated by this. Maybe it'll take me my whole life long. I don't know. But if it does, great. I can never claim my faith is boring or there's a lack of something new to grow or learn in. I want to sit down and say, okay, God, I'm going to start. Where am I at? Here. And I want you to help this make sense to me, bring it alive to my spirit, teach me. I just want to be with you and I just want to know you. And sometimes I get through one line, and I'm like, whoa, by the Spirit of God, what does that mean? And I get on this rabbit trail of studying and footnotes and going through. And sometimes I read through a couple chapters. It, 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 there's no formula to do this right other than the formula of setting aside the time to sit down and open it up, opening your hearts and your hands in prayer to say, God, teach me, and committing to the discipline of that rhythm. He will do it. He will blow your mind. I had to buy a new Bible because I wanted a different translation, but also because yours should run ragged. You've opened it so many times. Don't be intimidated. Pray before you read. I bind up a spirit of intimidation or fear. The enemy, you have no weapon formed against me that can stand. The flaming arrows that it speaks of and the word of the evil one. You know what? I serve a God who is with me and for me, and is who is going to help me understand this. And so I am just going to do my part of sitting down with it and giving him my first fruit to understand him and to follow him. So don't get intimidated. Don't get scared. There's a thousand million plans for reading out there. I say start in the Gospels, go to Acts and into the New Testament, and come back into the Old Testament. The Old Testament is amazing and beautiful. Um, but it's just the discipline and the rhythm of doing it. And that's, that's the best place to start. Pray for understanding and dig in. Oh, and do it with people. Have a group that y'all work through it together. Hey, guys, let's start in Acts. Let's text each other each day after our reading. What'd you get out today? Where are you? Okay, I learned this. Really cool. Great to do it with community. It keeps you accountable. Anything else? Lame. Okay, you guys, thank you so much. I hope any of that encouraged you or spoke truth. Go to class. <laughs>